I've always wanted to do a show with drag artists who have different styles, backgrounds, and views. A show where they can tell their story their way. And in a perfect world, I join in on the conversation. This is that show. We call it Exposed. Hey everybody, it's Joseph Shepard and welcome to Exposed. It is the show where I chat with some of your favorite queens about how they became who they are and what they do. Now today I am joined by a legendary queen who I know from the LA scene, but you guys may know from season 10 of RuPaul's Drag Race and also All Stars 5. It is Mayhem Miller. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Happy to be here. I'm like exposed. Like, are we exposing things? Everything. Everything that you could ever want. Because I'm down. Like, I can't do it on uh, Instagram anymore, but I could do it here if you want. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're going to get into it. Yeah, thirst traps. Here we go. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I know you from being in LA, and you are the LA queen. Let me just tell you, (laughs) if there's a show, Mayhem is performing. You are iconic, legendary. Um, I just want to tell you that before we even get started. Oh, and I'm so, um, so excited to be chatting with you. I would love to start with your life. Okay. Have you always been a Riverside girl? Uh, I was born and partially raised here in LA. Okay. Um, when we were, when I probably was like around five or six, that's when I moved to Riverside. Okay. And been there ever since. Okay. Yeah. Well, I came back to LA in my 20s and lived in West Hollywood for a brief moment. And then I went back to Riverside. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were growing up, what were you like as a child? <laughs> I don't, I've never even asked my parents this. I probably should. Um, in my experience, uh, I would say I was um, an imaginative kid. Okay. Um, I was not afraid to uh, be out there. I was very uh, extroverted. I loved to perform. I liked to make people laugh. I liked to sing and dance. And I was the kid that at like family functions, I was the one doing a show for people. Mm-hmm. So like it was, I'm busting out my clarinet. I'm going to sing this song. I'm going to do this dance. Like I was that kid. A clarinet? Yes. You play the clarinet? Oh, yes. Can you still play? Um, I, if you gave me one, yes, I probably could, but I wouldn't know what I'm doing. Like I used to, <laughs> like, I, I wouldn't know, be like, oh, this is B flat. Like, no, I wouldn't know. <laughs> when, when did you, um, come to the realization that, hey, you know what? I'm maybe a part of the LGBTQ community. Oh gosh. Um, I think like, just like a lot of kids find out you're told before you even know what it is. Oh yes. Yeah. So I remember, I remember as a kid being teased a lot and being called sweet fag punk, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I had no clue what it was. I just knew it was not good. Mm -hmm. So initially I, I just associated those things as being bad. And so coming from a religious background and a family that was uh, really about, you know, being strong Christian people, I was just like, Oh my God, I can't be what these people are saying that I am. Once I, found out what that was and I was like oh gosh I really can't be this and then then I accepted my truth (laughs) (laughs) the the links I went to to see naked men I'm like yeah I'll go to the grocery store with you mom sure (laughs) I want to read my teen bot magazine yeah just walking around fucking Ralph's with a hard on (laughs) (laughs) well you you slightly mentioned um Religion. Yes. Was your family very religious? Oh my God. Yeah. My mom was my Sunday school teacher at one point. Stop. Yeah. Oh yeah. So like she didn't play no games. Like she'd be like, this is the lesson that I'm going to teach on Sunday. You better know everything. Do not make me look stupid. Like I would have to know all my Bible verses, like everything. Oh yeah. So did you, when you came out, how old were you? I came out when I was. 18. I came out my senior year of high school. Okay. And did the, how was the family reception? Oh, it was bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was bad. Um, Because I tried to cushion a blow and like some people do. And I was like, oh, I'm bi. 
I'm I, I'm bi. I like girls still, but I think I like guys. And of course, everyone knew like oh, yeah. you're you're gay. But um, eventually, I was like, okay, yeah, no, I'm gay. Yeah, I'm I'm gay. But um, it took it took my my family a minute to adjust to that because you know they have to grieve the person that they thought you you would be. Yes. And it for me being that person, I was like, no, you need to accept me. You need to accept me. This is who I am. This is my truth. I was forgetting that they needed to process it too. So it, it was a lot of bumping of heads. Um, but we eventually got to a place where we were able to have healthy conversations about it mm. and accept my new self and accept the, the person that they had to let go. Yeah. Because I think that that was the biggest struggle that my mom had with it was that I was brought up the same way, very religious, you know, church every Sunday, Wednesday, all of that, went to a private school. And I think that, for her, it's exactly what you said. And I've never necessarily looked at it that way, that mm -hmm. you have to give them the time to grieve who they lost. Because you have to remember, like, they gave birth to you and they had this whole map of who they thought you would be and who you would grow up to be and the dreams and the aspirations that they had focused on you as their child now has to change. Yeah. And especially when I came out, this is in uh, 99, 2000, you know, the world was a different place for LGBTQI plus people. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the pushback I was getting was fear. They were afraid of what would happen to me once I left and went into this different stage of my life. Mm -hmm. It was a lot of, oh, my God, you have to be safe. We don't know what's going to happen to you. Blah, blah, blah. That's like back when Matthew Shepard had just happened and stuff. And, you know, it, it, it was just and I live in a rural part of Southern California, I, I like in a, uh, a very red area. Mm -hmm. So like, it was very, it was a very scary thing for them as well. So I, I didn't take that into consideration when I first came out. How far from you coming out to you doing drag? How many years was that? <laughs> so I, I was, I was terrible. Cause I hit my family with two whammies, like back to back. So I came out when I was 18. And I started doing drag when I was twenty. Yeah, <laughs> two whammies, two big ones. Yeah, and then that, especially back then, they didn't really know much about drag, yeah. so they assumed that I wanted to become a woman. So they thought I was trans, <laughs> and I'm like, no, I'm not trans. I, I, I'm a boy, but I'm gonna get this money because I, yes. I, I, I can see that these bitches is making coin. <laughs> like if they just put on the wig and some stuff. So I was like, no, I wanted to explore that, that, that uh, creative side of me. And yeah, I, 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 two years later started doing drag. So you're doing drag eight years before drag race even comes out. Yes. There isn't even a phenomenon behind it. There's nothing crazy. What was it like working in nightlife as a queen? Those first basically 10, 11, 12 years. Oh, gosh. Well, I guess it depends on the region, because mm -hmm. here in Southern California, every city has a different drag vibe. Well, now at least. Um, but back in the day, there was no drag. Mm -hmm. It was none. It was, uh, there was like Mickey's in West Hollywood um, on Mondays, Dream Girls at Rage on Tuesdays, and then Inland, where I'm from, there was VIP. And that was Friday nights. Um, Sundays were Orange County for Oz. Um, and then there was uh, Hamburger Mary's in Long Beach on Wednesdays, I believe. That was it. I lie. There were like, then there was like, uh, there was a black club that had drag shows, um, The Study. Um, and The Catch, I think, had shows back then too. And then um, Arena had shows as well. But it was very just like one show here, one show there, one show here, wow. one show there. It was not how it is now where there's a brunch on every corner at every restaurant, gay, straight or whatever. There's three shows in one night at this bar and you can go across the street for another show there. It was none of that. And it was just a handful of queens. It was not a lot of drag really around here. Did you start seeing an uptick in queens once the show came out? Oh, my God. Everybody wanted to be a drag Everybody wanted to be a drag queen. Not initially, because after the first season, it was new still. Mm -hmm. I think the phenomenon of Drag Race started to kick in after second season. 
third season, fourth season, that's when it really start, like started the run. After that, that's when you start to see a lot more drag. A lot. It like boomed out of nowhere. There was there was still drag happening and it was it got more there were more opportunities in drag mm-hmm. before drag race. Um right before it came out and stuff, but it after those few first seasons, then it just exploded. Did it take a hit to your career at all? No. <laughs> you were like, I'm established and I am good. No, um, I've I've been one of the very blessed, lucky few that I gained popularity before getting on Drag Race. Mm-hmm. I established my drag career long before that. So I was already producing shows in LA, Orange County, San Diego, Palm Springs, Inland area. I was already traveling out of town gigs and stuff. I already started doing those things that other girls were trying to do once they got on Drag Race. So like, it, it didn't affect me once it came out. It was, it was more like, okay, well now I wanna get that extra check that those girls are getting. Yes. So when did you, had you applied every single season? <laughs> Not every. So first season, we heard about it. Um, it was like rumbles in the community that there was going to be this show and they were looking for drag queens. Um, it came out and we all saw it and we're like, okay, cool. You know, it is what it is. Then they were like, we're casting another season. And so then that's when they used to scout and they would actually go and find drag queens. And so they would come to Mickey's and uh, Rage, mm-hmm. and they would be like, hey, we're, gonna, we're scouting, we're trying to like cast this show. And <laughs> season two, they came, I, I'll never forget it, they came to fucking Mickey's, asked us, and it was me, the cast at that time was a set cast. It was me, Raven, Morgan, and um, Jackie Beat, I believe. And they came backstage, they asked us if we want to do it, we all said no. Everyone's like, no, we're cool. Those bitches lied to me, went and fucking filmed audition tapes with those people, and then got on the show. Stop. I didn't know this until Morgan was going away and asked um, the day that she was going to the airport um, to leave. They were like, she was like, um, can you just make sure my dad's okay? And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? Where are you going? Like, yeah. And she was like, oh, um, I, I just have to go do this thing. And I'm like, what thing? And she's like, I can't talk about it. I just got to go do this thing. And then I was like, oh, this bitch is going to go film that fucking show they were talking about. And then the next day, we were all supposed to work together uh, in v- at VIP in Riverside, and Raven wasn't there. And I was like, what the fuck? And I'm like, these motherfucking bitches, they went and did the show. And, and they didn't like, even tell you. Didn't even tell me. Fucking assholes. Yeah. Sh- shady fucking cunts. Let's put a hypothetical here. Let's put a hypothetical. <laughs> Let's say that you would have said yes uh-huh. and you would have done it. Uh-huh. How do you think you would have fared on that second season? Ooh, I think it would have been fun because mm-hmm. I would have been there with three of my my close friends and it would have just been let's dominate and just take over. It would have been fun because yeah. I I our our vibe together is hilarious and I think it would have made good TV and especially being comfortable doing something like that, especially back then when it was more, I think it had a vibe of being more authentic. It wasn't, yes. it wasn't yes. people going with a character and an agenda and making their own, producing their own stories. It was literally like, let's go and show them the best drag queen. Mm-hmm. I think it would have been a fun thing. So I think too, I was like thinking about it right now, when you said that, I was like, ooh, that would have been a good season. It would have been fun. It really would have, especially the challenges they had back then. I was like, the eating challenge was like my favorite thing. Oh my gosh, I forgot about that. Yeah, I was like, why would it, because back then I loved Fear Factor and I was like, bitch, I could have did that, I could have ate anything. I would have, yeah, it would have been fun. And that was a fun cast too. That was a good cast. Yeah. So that ends up happening, but to a sideline before we get into more Drag Race, I want to know from you, what would a typical night in like 2001 to 2008, mm-hmm. what would a typical night be like for you? Like, <laughs> I want to hear like, like choose a club, go to this club, oh. tell me the environment. I want to know. I would pick up everyone. We would go to my drag mom's house um, and get in drag because I couldn't do it at home mm-hmm. <laughs> for obvious reasons. And uh, we would go to the club. After the club, we would, um, I would yell, follow the white focus. Everyone that was like, 
the ah like that was the that was the cue for everyone that be like okay we got to follow mayhem because she knows where the party's at and we would stop <laughs> at a CVS or a mm-hmm. Rite Aid, Walgreens, whatever, whatever was near, <laughs> and I would give Morgan the keys in my car, and I would run inside, grab a handle of vodka, <laughs> grab a thirty pack of beer or whatnot, and run. <laughs> and all she had to do was keep the car running, have the window down. I would throw everything in, dive head first, and we'll speed off. And we would do it every Friday and Saturday. <laughs> and I would take everyone to um, either a party or I, we would go to um, the local cruising spot, which was a park. And um, we would just act a fucking mess and cause a lot of mayhem. <laughs> I love this. Oh, yeah. I wish I could have been a part of this. This sounds like a moment. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Late Years later, um, after I got on Drag Race and stuff, I went to one of the places I would do my beer runs. I'm a, I think Statue of Limitations has run out, so I can't get in trouble for yeah, that yeah, yeah. So uh, I remember I was at one of the stores, and I was getting rung up for a birthday card, and the lady was like, um, is that all you want? And I was like, oh, yeah, just a card. Thank you. She's like, you're not going to get anything else? And I was like, well, shit, is there a sale or something? Like, <laughs> when, when am I supposed to get some gum or a lotto ticket? Like, what? And she's like, you do realize I know who you are. And I was like, oh, you watch Drag Race? And she's like, well, yeah, not only that, but um, I've been watching you for years. And I was like, oh, like, where? I had VIP, I had Mickey's Rage. I'm naming all the clubs. And so she's like, no, on our security cameras. And I was like, oh, been watching what? And she's like, you're the drag queen that would like to come in here and steal on the weekends. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I was gagged, bitch. I was like, wait, what? And I had to be like, I couldn't be like, no, it's not me. Because yeah. obviously you know who I am now. And then she was like, she's like, we would let you do that. She's like, you do realize you were doing that every Friday and Saturday for a couple of years. I was like, yeah. And she's like, we would let you do that because it would be the funniest thing for us to watch on the camera. <laughs> She's like, you would just run in with your little mini skirt and blonde wig and act like we kind of, like nobody was watching you and you'd just be like, snatch, run. And <laughs> She's like, we would laugh so hard. I was like, do you guys still have that footage? <laughs> She's like, no, of course not. But she was like, it was the funniest thing ever. She was like, and I would tell people when I would see you on TV, Mayhem used to come and steal beer at my job all the time. <laughs> Well, you you applied how many times for Drag Race? I started applying after season two. Okay. Yeah. And then I finally got on. So season 10 comes around. Yeah. Where were you when you got the phone call? I'll never forget. I was in uh, Vancouver, Canada. I was up there doing Pride. Okay. And um, finished the gig. I was flying back home. I get to the airport. And... Um, I get a phone call and I'm like, what's this number? And I wasn't going to answer, but I was out of the country. So I was like, maybe it's important. You should probably answer it. So I was like, hello. And it was one of the producers, um, Mandy. And she was like, hi, May. And I said, hi. She said, hey. So uh, I'm calling from Drag Race. I was like, "Uh uh-huh. She was like, this is the call you've been waiting for. And I was like, what? I was like, well, no, 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 I was like, what does this mean? Because in my head, I've, I think I've rehearsed this moment. I'm like, wait, what? And she's like, I, she's like, I want to personally call you to tell you this because I know you've been waiting so long for this. And she's like, you finally made it. And I was like, and I, I was in the stall in the bathroom and I started weeping. I just, <laughs> that kind of crying. And the funniest thing happened after that because, all of a sudden, I hear a little boy. He's like, Dad, that lady is in there crying. <laughs> he's like, there's a lady in the bathroom. And I was like, I'm okay. <laughs> I will never forget it. I, I broke down at the airport because that's where I got it. I got the call in, in Vancouver. So you get on the show. Your dress, that first episode. Mm-hmm. The glove dress. Yes. 
iconic. <laughs> iconic. Thank you. Your whole performance, not your actual whole, but the Courtney, <laughs> Courtney Love whole performance. Iconic. I mean, my whole does perform a lot, but yeah, that one too. Um, yeah, that was that was a fun lip sync. So, what was it like that first episode? Um, stressful, stressful because uh, that was not the first dress I made. I made another dress before I made that one. I made that that glove dress the day a couple like literally a couple hours before we went down the runway. Wow. I started making something because we had to get stuff out of the bin from the 99 cent store. And I had something in my mind of like a corset, but I grabbed all the Brillo pads, like the the like copper ones mm -hmm. and the silver ones. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna deconstruct this, make it like a, a big old like abstract like corset thing and blah blah blah. I'm cutting my hands up doing this. And after that first day that we had to work on our outfit, I got in the room and I just bawled because it just looked terrible. And I'll never forget it because Eureka was like, girl, you're going to be OK. And, I'm, and I knew in her mind, she was like, this bitch is going home because <laughs> it was terrible. It was ugly. And I just prayed that night and I was like, God, I was like, help me. I was like, I, I, I need to figure this out. Help me. And I just thought about my mom praying over me and laying her hands on me and got into the workroom that morning. I looked in the corner and I saw the black gloves on the ground. That was the only thing left over that no one touched. And I was like, oh my God, there it is. And then I just grabbed the gloves and grabbed the umbrella and some trash bags and started braiding the trash bags to make it look like distressed leather. And and sewed it all together and threw it on and walked down the runway. My reaction was genuine. I literally lost my shit because I thought I got finally got there 10 years later or on to season 10 after all those years of auditioning and I was going to go home first. So I fucking lost my shit that day. I was just like, yeah. oh, God. Yeah, it was a mess. What was your overall experience like on Drag Race? Because I will say sometimes a queen's legendary status does not translate into a competition show. And I'm that queen. <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> correct. I am not, I, I am not embarrassed about it either. I own it. Some people go on, especially on these later seasons of Drag Race, they go in as a completely realized character. Mm -hmm. These people are like, they studied the show and they've studied how social media works and they study what the trends are and what the viewers like. So they go in there with a character. It's not genuine. These people are fucking mm -hmm. fake as fuck. I'm not one of those girls. I'm a down home bar queen. I go and I just lip sync at night and make people's nights better. That's what I do. I'm a simple fucking bitch. So when I go on TV, it's not the boom, 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 bang, 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 and all the this and mm -hmm. all this and all that. No, it's I'm just there to just show that I'm a good queen. That's it. And... It, it gets you sent home. <laughs> well, see, that's why that's why I was thinking in my head. I was like, when you said season two, I was like, that would have been the moment for you. Like yeah. that those earlier seasons where everybody was so themselves. And I think you you brought up a great point. Like, we don't know who's who anymore because everything is so calculated. Mm -hmm. Everybody doesn't want to step on anybody's toes for everyone's social scared. media. Yes. They, they don't want to they don't want to upset the fan base because then it means that they're not gonna get deals and endorsements and bit good gigs and all that shit and i'm i'm not that girl yeah. i'm like i don't care <laughs> i don't care i'm just here to have a good time that's it so you you feel the same way you feel that you that some competitions are not meant for all queens i there are people in my life that want to be on drag race really badly and the best advice i give them is be careful what you wish for i was like because you might not get the outcome that you one. Mm. I went to Drag Race season 10 and I was like, I know I'm the baddest bitch. I'm a fucking amazing drag queen. I'm going to win this shit. I did not take in consideration there are cameras on you for fucking the whole goddamn filming day and you're not giving them any kind of fucking thing to work with. You're literally just focusing on being a good drag queen. Mm. And everyone else is producing stories and and sharing their stories and making up stories. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like... I wasn't doing that. I was just, I was in my head like, oh no, bitch, I'm going to sew this outfit. I'm going to do this and I'm going to make sure my makeup is beat and I'm, 
I was like, no, I, I was going in in a different mindset and a different way of playing the game. Mm-hmm. And um, looking back on it, like I'm, I'm like, damn. Now that I know how to play the game, I, sh- I wish I would have went into it that way. But I, I'm glad that I didn't because I feel that my fan base still knows who my true self is. Mm-hmm. They know who I am. And I'm not there to impress all the rest of the world and give them what they want. I'm like, no, I'm mayhem and this is what you're going to get. And yeah. I've always been the same person since the beginning days of 2001 or two or whatever it is. I want to talk to you about the iconic moment. Iconic. E-Y-E. Yes. <laughs> because the funny thing about that was that it wasn't new. No. It was something from years ago. 20 years ago. <laughs> and I have never in my life, I was like, when that came back around and it became a viral thing, do you remember that moment? Do you remember where you were? I remember because my nephew sent it to me and he was like, someone told me that this is you. Is this you? And I'm like, what is this? And he's like, it's like all over social media. And I'm, I'm not really a social media person. Like I go on to to like fuck around, post my shows Mm -hmm. where I'm going to be at and go live and talk to my fans. That's it. I don't really play in it like that, but I started seeing it and I started seeing it and then people started tagging me and it just became a wave. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? I'm like, this is my old drama performance at Mickey's like 20 years ago. I'm like, who who found this and who made this happen? I'm like, what the fuck? But it was a blessing in disguise because I was like, now I was being re-emerged into the fan base. And then not only that, into mainstream entertainment world, people were like, like Paris Hilton and like, all these other people are starting to use this meme and I'm like, Oh my God. Like, and people are like, that's Mayhem Miller. Oh my God. And so a lot of people were like, wait, what? <laughs> so it, it, it introduced a lot of people to my body of work before drag race. And then for all the people that have been fans for years, they were like, yeah, that, of course that's Mayhem. That's, that's her like biggest number. Like we all know her for that. Like, so it was, it was a cool thing. What was your favorite moment from um, all stars lunch? Lunch? Lunch. Was it good lunch? Ask any of my castmates. I would talk about the cake every day. Did cake? Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. So that was the thing. It would be like, what kind of cake we got today? And they'd be like, mayhem, we have red velvet. And I'd be like, I'm, I'm going to need the cake. Bring me the cake. Bring me the cake, anime. I want the cake. Me and India would die about the cake every day. She'd be like, may, it's lemon today. I'm going to need a little piece of lemon, too. <laughs> it was the lunch was my favorite time because I was like, okay, now I can let my hair down. Yeah. Now I can have fun and just kiki with the girls and have a good time and, and do my favorite thing, eat. Was the food different from season 10 to All Stars? Yes. It was better. You know, bigger budgets. And mm-hmm. stuff. Bigger budget. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. As the seasons go by, we get more and more money. <laughs> I love I love hearing the early girls be like, we got to have one taco from Taco Bell. Yeah, like, they were like, how did they feed you? And I'm like, bitch, we would have, we would have steak, we would have fucking shrimp, we would have, we would have good food. And they're like, what? We had El Pollo Loco. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, well, you were on that logo budget. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you get off of the show, uh-huh. and I want to know, how did your career change from the early days before Drag Race to after Drag Race? Did you see? anything pivotal change in your career or did everything kind of stay the same? It, I didn't think it was going to change much. Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, I'll probably like start working a little bit more out of town. Um, but it changed. Like my life really, really did change. Um, I was gone that first couple years. I was gone all the time traveling and doing tours and, and, just seeing the fans around the world, like that was my life for a while. So I had to take a step back from my day to day. And my day to day was literally, I was a working queen Mm -hmm. Monday through Monday. I didn't have a day off. I worked every day of the week doing shows around all of Southern California. So I had to take a step back from that and then dedicate my time to this new part of my life, which sucked because 
as much as I was loving seeing the world and meeting all the fans and reaping the rewards of my hard work all those years, I missed home. Yeah. I missed everyone. And I was like, oh my God, my, my friendships and personal relationships were suffering because I was no longer there mm -hmm. and I was missing out on so much. So. So you didn't like that? No. Mm -mm. No, I, I didn't like the fact that, you know, my friends would be like, oh, my God, we're going to go on a wine trip, you know, because me and my group of friends would go wine tasting all the time. And they were like, oh, we went went to the wineries. Where are you at? And I'm like, oh, well, I'm here in Germany wishing I was on a wine trip, but. I'm over here. I'll have a glass thinking of y'all. You know, it was just, it just, it sucked. I was just like, I, I, I missed my family. I missed my friends. Um, so I had to learn balance. Mm -hmm. I had to learn balance really quick. So where do you stand at that today? Do you have like a, a certain regimen of like, I will do X amount of gigs outside of California? Or like, how do you do that? I recently, well, no, not recently. It's been the past because pandemic hit, you yeah. know, so everything pretty much stopped. But leading up to before the stop of the world, I was like, uh-uh, I, I got I to gotta find balance. I have to because my personal life is suffering. Mm -hmm. My professional life is doing great, but there's time. That I need to focus on Dewan. And so after the world started opening back up again, I was just like, you know what? I've been to a lot of places. I would love to continue being to a lot of places, but I need to do it in a way that is more healthier for me and the relationships I have outside of my profession. Mm -hmm. So um, now I'm just like, okay, you know, if an opportunity comes, I just say, okay, look at the calendar. Do I have something already planned? Because if I have my friend's, you know, wedding or their housewarming, I'm going to that. Yeah. And I'm just going to have to say no to the money. You know, not all money is good money. I will see those fans as eventually at some point. Hopefully they will, you know, work with my schedule and have me back at a different time. But I learned that, you know, it's all right to say no. It's cool. Mm -hmm. There's going to be other opportunities. You don't have to just say yes right now because you have to because you feel forced. Yeah. I love that because I think that that's a big thing no matter what in life. It's just you always feel like you're obligated to say yes when yeah. you can take some time for yourself. Yeah. It's okay to take time for yourself. It is like a lot of people are afraid to do that because they feel like if I pass up on the opportunity, there's no longer going to be an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And my thing is I've always told people your talent and your professionalism will always speak volumes. People will always look for you and find you. If you just fucking do your job and do it well. Yeah. So. Book me, bitch. <laughs> I'm going to pull up some fan questions okay. that I had the lovely fans come in and ask. Oh, God. I'm going to ask it in the way that I want to ask it. Oh, shit. Okay, okay. So there was a little moment that you had probably about a week or two ago. Okay. Revolving around a video. Oh, yeah. On Sloppy Seconds. Oh, here we go. <laughs> this show is called Exposed, so we had to do it. <laughs> um, where... I believe that the queen who said it was, was it Kimchi? Yes, because she was on, yes, she yes. was the guest, and they were talking about, okay, yes, yeah. yes, yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. So, this episode of Sloppy Seconds, Kimchi was on, they were talking, and Kimchi alludes that there was, or there is a queen who is a California local who uses her Tesla and gets drunk and uses the Tesla auto drive. Yes. Then on TikTok, Somehow, some way, the video got kind of tagged as Mayhem Miller. Then the fans were pulling up an old video of you talking to Michelle Visage in a Tesla, and it was auto driving. So they decided to put two and two together and say that it was you. Yeah. Would you like to speak on that? Sure. <laughs> so first of all, I don't have a Tesla. On that video, when I was uh, live with her, when I was driving, I was not driving a Tesla. I was lying about that shit. <laughs> so, <laughs> first of all, I don't see the purpose of spending that kind of money on that fucking car. I buy fucking property. I invest my money in different ways. So, no, I do not have a Tesla. I lied on that when I was talking with, with her on her live. 
um, when I saw that and it was attaching me to it, Mm -hmm. I was like, absolutely fucking not. First of all, that's reckless. And that's not okay because especially with the fans, they will run with shit. And that is potentially not only pitting my my character into a place where it doesn't need to be, first of all, because I'm not that fucking person. Mm-hmm. I've been very vocal and open about my struggles with addiction and alcoholism and my DUIs. I have nothing to lie about. I have nothing to lie about at all. I've been, I've said it on television before. It's all there. So I've made so many changes in my life and so many adjustments and I've worked so hard on me. I don't need someone to defame me and tell people she's a drunk driver and she's over yes. here driving a Tesla and this and that and, that and, and letting it auto drive and she's putting everybody at jeopardy and at risk. No, that's not true. That's not true. It, that conversation should have never happened. Because you can't allude to anyone like that because people are going to run with that shit and it's going to turn into something way bigger than what it needs to be. It was not a conversation that should have happened. It should have never aired. Mm -hmm. I went to, of course, social media and I addressed it because it wasn't cool because I'm like, I I don't know who they're talking about, but it was not me. Yeah. And people were assuming it was me and it's assuming my history and my past that it would be me. And that was not fair. It was not okay. So I addressed it and I immediately got phone calls <laughs> and got apologies and it was removed. And um, I'm the type of person that I want people to allow me the same grace. So I'm going to give people grace as well. Mm-hmm. So if you tell me that you are sorry, you made a mistake and that was not your intentions and it was a mistake. I, I'm like, okay, cool. We're good to go. We're, we're fine. I, I believe that people can make mistakes and they can move past it and everything could be fine. So there's no hard feelings. There's no, no fucking grudges, no anger. We're all fucking good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that that's, that's the important thing that what you said is that assuming. And a lot of times fans will, if a, if a queen is vague about something, they are going to automatically assume. They're going to assume they're going to dig and they're yes. going to try to find whatever's going to suit their fucking agenda. Yes. And, that's what happens. No assumptions. And also, also the biggest thing too, us drag queens may have issues with each other, but that does not validate any fans out there to take the battle on as your own. Stop. Let adults handle their shit. You don't have to jump in and fight for any of us. And you da- damn sure don't need to be attacking anyone when you don't know facts. 100%. How was it filming um, Drag Me to Dinner? Oh my gosh, it was fun. I love when I get to do projects where I'm not in um, a serious competition mode. Like Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people ask me like um, whether I like being in front of the camera at Drag Race or behind the camera. And I always tell everyone I like being in behind the camera now because I don't have the pressure of trying to compete. I don't have to do that. Even though Drag Me to Dinner was a competition, it really wasn't. It was it was just, let's just have some fun. We got there and they're like, just have fun with it. Just be yourselves and just have a good time. And I got to be there with, you know, some of my closest friends. I'm like, I was there with, with Morgan. I was there with Detox and Raja. And we have all, like, Raja was the first drag queen I ever saw in my life. And, you know, just to be able to still have a friendship with her, still be able to see her and work with her and do things like it, it just reminds me of the old days when we mm-hmm. first started doing drag together and stuff. And then, you know, uh, me and Morgan have been side side by side since we were fucking 18, you know, so being able to do things with my sister is, is a fun opportunity and detox me and detox have a, a special bond that mm-hmm. no one can break like that. I tell everyone, I'm like, I probably will end up marrying detox. Like we'll end up being old biddies together. Like, <laughs> Um, it was just a fun experience to be able to go out of town with actual friends mm-hmm. and make some art and have a good time doing it and get paid. Yeah, and it looked fun. <laughs> it, it was looked so like you guys fun. were having so much fun. It was so much fun. And like, I, I like when we have the freedom to just let loose. Yeah. And whatever happens, happens. Yeah. I think that that aspect of drag is uh, really special because you actually get to see the personalities of people and not so much uh, 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 
a character that they create that they're very like structured about. Like I think that that ep- especially that episode we were able to just let loose. Mm-hmm. I want to know from you when things happen one day as we all wither away, which we will do one day. <laughs> what do you hope your legacy is? Oh my gosh. Um, it's funny because I see my legacy now. I see it now, like, um, with my drag children and all the things that they have done and their children. Like now, my some of my drag kids are having kids, and I like the other night had a group, uh, two girls come up to me at the Abbey, and they were like, "Hey, Grandma," and I was like, "What kind of fucking grandma, <laughs> fucking bitch?" I was like, and they're like, "Oh, we're Raya's daughters," and I was like, "Oh," I was like. Don't call me grandma. <laughs> I was like, don't call me grandma, but I'm like, you call me mother as well. But um, it's just, it's great to see that this little hobby of mine that I took on just for shits and giggles and to have a great time um, turned into a magical career. Uh, it has birthed a lot of other careers. It's inspired a lot of people around the world. And um, if I was to stop drag tomorrow, I would be so proud of what I've done. Because um, I am a legend. You are. <laughs> fucking iconic. I'm like, oh, it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, like, when you think about it. Because um, as an artist, sometimes you don't feel seen. And you do everything that you can to please people. And um, there's been many nights I've sat up and cried because I'm like, why did I do this? Why am I doing this? Like, yeah. what, what, what is this? And I'm always reminded. All, God always sends a messenger and lets me know exactly why I'm doing this. And I get that confirmation, that confirmation on a daily basis every time I, I get to a club. Because it never fails. The nights that I'm having a low night, someone comes up to me and it's someone that needs to speak, needs to talk to someone. Someone who needs to be seen. And I'm that person. A lot of people don't give bar queens the love and the justice and the praise that they deserve because so many lost people find their ways into our nightclubs and our night spaces and they're lonely they're hurt they're coming from traumas they're coming from dark places and they go and seek something to escape from Mm -hmm. and we are those people that help with that journey to let them escape and forget for a moment while they're there and it never fails every night someone comes up to me and they say Thank you. I needed this. Thank you for what you do. You have no idea what this done for me. You know, I. Oh, I'm going to get teary eyed. Like, you never know the people that you touch. You never know. So my legacy. I'm pretty I'm pretty happy about I'm happy with what I've done. No regrets. You should be. And I think that it's just your name is a staple. Having people come up to you and tell you things like that. That's everything. I have this little, little show that I do and I have people who say things like that. And I'm like, I never would have thought yeah, that my don't. personal story or something that I am doing can bring you joy in a time of hell or yeah. a time. of. so having that's that's awesome, though, because I do think that you have a really fucking good legacy Aww. and you should be very proud <laughs> of it. Thank you. As we're starting to close all this out, I want to know what you think the biggest misconception of Mayhem Miller is? <laughs> um, that I am like a crazy partier. I think, I, I think a lot of people still think that I'm that girl and I'm not like with age mm-hmm. and wisdom, I have learned, you know, it's not cute to be the last person at the party. It's not cute to black out and, you know, wander a stranger's house naked. It's not cute. Oh, I'm, I'm like spilling all my tea, but <laughs> like I've done a lot of stupid shit in my my reckless days of partying. You know, I wanted to be the girl that everyone knew as a good time because that was my way of coping with not having the love that I was looking for. It was like, okay, well, if I could be that girl that everyone's like, oh, she she's the party girl. She knows where all the drugs are at. She knows where all the liquor's at. She knows where to go and where... Like, I wanted to be that person because that was the love that I needed, the mm-hmm. attention that I needed. And so I didn't want to let go of that. I was like, okay, well, I got to keep partying. I got I to gotta keep doing this. And once I found the love that I needed, which was in myself, 
I didn't need all that anymore. So a lot of people, when they see me, they see the reserved side of myself because I am an extrovert introvert. They're like, well, you're the queen of the party, but why are you so like chill? And I'm like, I'm a very chill person because I've done all that. I've experienced that, that side of life. And it was great. Good times. It was never a bad yeah. time. It was, it was good times. <laughs> and my last question for you, Mayhem, is what do you have coming down the pipeline? What can people expect from you? Oh, my gosh. Um, just me still fucking pushing and paint, push and party. That's what I do. Paint, push and party. Paint, push and party. That's what, every night I'm at some club. Paint, pushing, and party. You know, I, I, I'm not one of those girls that likes to be like, oh, I'm working on these projects, and because <laughs> usually those people are not working on anything. Exactly, they're, they're lying. But exactly, um, I I work every night of the week. You can see me at the Abbey. You can see me at VIP in Riverside. You can see me in Palm Springs at 111. You can see me in San Diego at Moe's. Um, you can see me uh, in Long Beach at Hamburger Mary's. You can see me in Ontario at Mary's. You can see me. Um, at Mickey's, like you can see me everywhere. Like I'm, I'm always working. I'm always doing something. Um, yeah. And if not, I'm at home watching my 90 Day Fiance. Hey. And we should start having a watch party. I used to do a watch party during uh lockdown. I used to go live and and watch it with my fans, and we would just sit there and talk shit about TV. No, I meant me that. and you watching oh, you... 90 Day Fiance. Come over. Yeah. Come over. Totally. Yeah. And do that. We, oh, what? What's your favorite snack? Ooh, are we talking like candy, food? Like, what are we? Oh no, when I snack, I snack. So there's going to be a little bit of everything: foods, deli- uh, desserts, candy. Can I tell you what drinks. I've wanted for the longest time? What? You're gonna be like, really? Pigs in a blanket. Okay, good, good. I thought that you're pushing that away because you don't. Fucking love them, and I just saw a recipe on. Uh, on Instagram. Oh, <laughs> I, I just saw a recipe. <laughs> so yeah, no, I saw a recipe the other day and um, they had took pa- uh, puff pastry um, and they rolled it in like everything bagel seasoning. Oh, bitch. I was like, oh my God. And then with a deli mustard too? Oh. My favorite snack snack is soft pretzels with Same. mustard and, and like nacho cheese. Come over. Okay, we're doing this. Come over, I'm telling you. We will sit there and we will binge. So good. Well, thank you so much, ma'am, for being here and chatting with me. Well, thanks for having me. I'm so thrilled. I'm, I'm, and I was like nervous. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm scared. I don't know what's going to happen. No, but, it's yeah, very fun. This is very chill. This is fun. So until next time, be sure to follow Mayhem. Where can they follow you on the socials? Oh my gosh. Well, it's private now. So you can't okay. follow me. <laughs> well... My, if you did not come to my party when I first had it open to everyone, you missed out. So it's it's private right now. Maybe I'll open it back up to the public, but um, there were too many people not respecting my boundaries. So it's a private party now. Hey. But if you choose to, and I might open it back up at the Only Mayhem on every social platform. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, I'm Joseph Shepard, and that's the fabulous Mayhem Miller. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>